welcome everyone uh, um, to this demo. So at 3 p.m. UK time, uh, uh, we'll have the discussion meeting uh, um, of uh, um, for the paper um, written by um, Professor Roe and uh, um, Dr. Mujie Zhang. Um, and so we have this demo to have an introduction uh, and Carl has um, um, kindly agreed uh, to present the introduction to the paper and with all um, the material that will be needed to understand the paper. So it's my pleasure to introduce this demo um, with Professor Carl Roe from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And before starting the demo, uh, I just want to remind everyone uh, um, that uh, this event is recorded and it may go on our um, on the RSS uh, YouTube channel. So as uh, Teresa uh, put in the chat, uh, if you would like uh, your contribution to be uh, deleted, just pr um, please just write uh, to Judith uh, and the email address is available in the chat. Another thing is that I remind you to um, keep uh, your cameras and microphone uh, off. Uh, Carl has accepted to um, receive questions during the demo. So if you have any question, please uh, um, put it in the chat or um, is there the raise hand uh, reaction? Yes, uh, you can use the raise hand reaction and I'll call your name. You can either put the question in the chat or turn on your microphone and ask the question. So um, thank you very much, Carl, to have a great to do this demo and uh, I'll let you introduce the subject and the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clara. And uh, thank you so much to Judith and the other support staff. Thank you so much to the discussion board for the uh, ability or for the, for the chance to, to present this material. Uh, so in the demo, I want to focus on this thing called principal component analysis, which I presume that many of you, perhaps all of you, have have heard a little bit about. I think there's certainly some that have not. And I want to give more intuition for this technique, and I want to uh, build on that then in, in, in the, the talk in one hour. And so uh, we're going to have some fun, I hope. Or I've had some fun preparing these slides. Um, and as Clara said, folks should feel free to turn on their microphone and ask any questions at any point. I want to address any concerns as they come up. And uh, I cannot see any raised hands or any chat. So anything that goes in there, I will not see. Clara, I hope you'll highlight that for me if it, if it appears there. So yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. So does anybody have a guess as to what this this object is? It's it's a household object. It's nothing. It, it looks fancy in the way that it's put up there, but it's not. It's it's a, it's a pretty standard household object. Perhaps this one's easier. Does anybody know what this is? Carl, that's a scissors. That's right, the scissors. I'll show you this. It, does, it looks like that there, but th that's scissors. That's right. OK, this one's maybe a little bit harder. Does anybody know what this is? I don't know if you guys use this in England or in the British colonies. We use this quite a bit in the States, I think. Anybody know? Is it like a ketchup packet? Ooh, good guess. No, it is not. There's a, there's a, there's, it's quite long in the back dimension, which you can't see. But good guess, fun guess. Is it toothpaste? It is not toothpaste. It moves, are you ready? Here, if you can see my screen here. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> I can't see is myself. Is it a tea strainer? Very good, yes, it's a tea strainer, yes. <laughs> So you put tea in there and then you put it in your, in your mug. Anybody uh, come up with a guess for this yet? I have it right. Uh, it's like a whisk. That's exactly right. It's a whisk. It's a whisk. Okay. So this is all related to the talk today, uh, and, and we'll talk about how it's related in a little bit. 
the key idea is hiding the longest dimension of objects is kind of a fun thing to do. And when we when we think about what something looks like, we're often kind of like implicitly imagining it in, in the long dimension. That's going to be related to PCA. Okay. So the title of this demo is Finding the Shape of High Dimensional Data with PCA and Why We Should Care. So a long time ago, 100 years ago, uh, this was like a very important example where Carl Pearson showed that father and son's heights were correlated in this way, and that's kind of a fun thing. And so people started imagining data to be shaped like this. It's only two dimensional data, right? You have for each row, you have two numbers. So we can plot it all on a page, right? Each dot has a father height and a son height. There's two columns. This is low dimensional data, only two columns. And it looks like a footy. We'd call that a football. Uh, and, and so in this talk, uh, we're interested in much higher dimensional data. So in my research, I, I study things like social networks or text documents. Financial time series also has this pro these properties, academic citation networks. In all of these examples and lots more, uh, you have lots of columns of data, not just two columns, but maybe hundreds or thousands or millions. And so we want to think about how we can visualize or imagine the shape of that data. By the end of the talk, I want to try and convince you that our basic understanding of how to interpret high dimensional data are hugely limited by our heuristics about football shape data, Gaussian data. It doesn't look like that. Uh, and because of this, there's far more that I think we can start thinking about with high dimensional data. And uh, in the talk, in an hour, I'll talk more about how psychologists had this type of data analysis that, that results from this all figured out in the 1930s, which is kind of fun. Okay, so here's my favorite example with social networks. I've only given a four, we call it node social network. So there's four people, A, B, C, and D, and their friendships are in this image on the left. You can represent this with columns, rows and columns of data as it is in this matrix here, where you see that A is friends with B, and so element AB is a one. Element a, uh, node A is not friends with D, so element AD is a zero. So it's called an adjacency matrix. And you can imagine if you have millions of people, this is millions of rows and millions of columns. So, in some of our research, we've looked at uh, samples of Twitter and the elite sphere of Twitter, where we have 300,000 users. And we often look at not only how they follow each other, but who else they follow. And so you get three, 300,000 by maybe 10 million. What's the shape of that data? Social networks or networks appear in other settings. So here's some uh, a blood flow graph from diffusion tensor imaging. This is uh, on the right is a uh, the uh, CDC in the United States made a, a map of social network, a social network map of heterosexuals at high risk for HIV in 1994 in Colorado Springs, which is kind of a, a wild network there with 5,000 people in it. Okay, and in all of these cases, you can represent, you can think of this as like this thing on the left, this picture with circles and dots, or you can think of it as an array or a matrix, or rows and columns of data. In the example that's in the, the paper that we're going to discuss in a bit, each node uh, is an academic journal. So JRSSB is one of those journals. JASA would be another one. Science and Nature and uh, BMJ and all of these academic journals appear in it. There's like, I think, 22,000 journals. And there's an edge pointing. It's not just undirected, but it's pointing from one journal to another if we estimate that there's at least 100 papers in journal A that cite papers in journal B. Okay. So this matrix is 22,000 by 22,000. It might be funny to think of text, representing text in an array. Uh, if, if you've not heard of this, this is sometimes referred to as bag of words, where you don't think of the order of words so much, but you just think of like, what words are in a document? So there's, suppose there's four documents here. 
one, two, three, and four. And the first document is very simple. It just says I am, right? And so there's a there's an and if you look at the first row here, both I and M get ones, and dog and hungry get zero. Then the third document is I am hungry. Uh, it doesn't contain dog. No document contains dog here. Uh, and the fourth document just contains hungry. It's something that my two-year-old says, hungry. It's a full sentence for him. Okay. Uh, historically, for the psychologists, they had what was for them high dimensional data. They would have maybe 100 people take, a, take an exam and maybe have 40 questions on that exam. And so element IJ is a one if somebody got, if person I got question J correct and zero otherwise, right? So you have a rather wide array given how many uh, rows that they had. And another example, uh, each row is a financial asset, each column is a time period, and so element JT gives the return of asset J at time T. And we'll look at these data uh, by the end of the talk. So the hard part of this talk is trying to figure out how you can imagine or visualize the shape of high dimensional data. What does that, what does that mean? We can only see in two dimensions at one time. And when not in the real world, maybe in real life we could see in three, but when we do data analysis, we print it on a page or have it on our computer screen. And at every instant, we only have a two dimensional surface there. So if our data is a million dimensions, we're gonna have to ignore 900, 99,998 dimensions at each go and only look at two. So we need to look at the most important dimensions. And I think that's kind of confusing. So to see what that means, let's do the opposite. Let's only look at the least important dimensions. We can only see two dimensions at a time, right? So this is very convenient because we are now all remote. And so uh, everything that you see of me is only two dimensions. Yes, is there a question? Okay. So what's this? We're going to get to do this a lot, so I hope you all find this game very fun because I find it super fun. Does anybody know what that is? TV remote control. That's a very good guess. It's not correct, but it's an, a tremendous oh, guess. Yes. Was there a second? Go ahead. Yeah. So it is, in fact, not a remote control for a TV, but is a remote control for like a, you know, it's like a clicker. And that thing there is like a USB stick. Okay. Very good. That's impressive. Okay. We already did the whisk, right? That's super fun. What about this one? Somebody's got to know what this is. Goggles. Very good. Yes, goggles. So there's goggles here. Ooh, this one's hard or maybe not credit card not a credit card but it is a card you'll never playing guess what the card let's say it again yeah. playing card yeah it's a playing card it's a pokemon card but you'd never guess what i mean like it could be a football card or a baseball card or in this case pokemon card And so it's hard to identify these items, but I think it's an interesting question. It's like this interesting curiosity of like, why? Like, why is that so hard? It's like almost like a philosophical question. Like clearly with the card, you just didn't even see what's on it. So maybe that's kind of not as interesting. But with this one, like, 
It's undoubtedly a whisk. And uh, the scissors, like once you, somebody tells you it's scissors, it's like, oh yeah, that's scissors. But like, this is way easier. What about this one? Oh shoot, where did I put that one? I lost my bag of tricks. Oh, here it is. You might know what this one is. Marker pen. Yeah, that's right. It's a marker pen. Kind of terrifying from that angle. What about this one? I had so much fun going through the house. Beer opener? A beer opener? No, that's a very good guess. Anybody else? A spoon. Getting closer. Butter knife. Butter knife, indeed. It's a butter knife. <laughs> okay. This one you'll never guess. I'm going to have to show you. It looks kind of fun from that angle, but from this angle, it's like a it's like a ring, uh, and it's, uh, it's it's also an eraser. My son told me. But, okay. You already did the scissors. How about this one? You can tell what that one is. Mobile phone. Yeah, it's an iPod. That's right. It's an iPod. Ooh, this one. I bet nobody will get this one. It is so hard. A key? Oh my gosh, who is that? How did you know? Honestly, how did you know? Uh, just have a lot of keys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's super impressive. Yeah, it's a key. It's just like kind of like old skeleton kind of key. Ooh, this one is good. Can you tell what that is? Anybody? A stamp? A what? A stamp? It's not a stamp. Looks like a piece of chocolate. It's not chocolate either. It does look like chocolate. I agree. You would not want to eat this one, though. Lego. Lego, that's right. It's a Lego. So. Kids try to eat these, but they're not edible. I'm almost fooling myself there. Okay, does anyone know what that one is? I knew I was going to lose one. I'm going to have to take my word for this one. Oh, no, I have it here. Anybody know what this one is? Laser pointer? It is not a laser pointer. Any other guesses? So indescript from that angle, isn't it? Any other guesses? I mean, I would guess a pen, but we already had a pen. It's like a pen. Yeah, it's a crayon. Yeah. Okay, now I have two counter examples. So this one, I'm showing you the biggest dimension, but you really want to see the skinny side of that one, don't you? Somebody says, I need an adapter, and then that you hand them that, they're like, well, is this the right adapter? I need to see the skinny sides. That's a counter example, I think. And then here, this one. <laughs> I'm kind of joking with this one. Anybody know what that one is? A ball. Yeah, it's just a ball. I'm kind of playing around making it look like it's deep, but it's just a ball. It doesn't have a long back dimension. No. Oh, I have a last one, too. Oh, yeah, this one. You can probably tell what that one is, right? Football. Yeah, it's a football. It's a football. That's exactly right. Is it football shaped? Not in that dimension. It's not, not football shaped. <laughs> it's not football shaped in that dimension. Isn't that funny? Okay. Okay. 
So the reason for all of this is that we can only see two dimensions at a time, and we need to look at the most important dimensions, thinking about data analysis. And so through all of this, I gave you that we had this very frustrating thing of, of trying to identify these objects, not by, by not seeing their most important dimensions, essentially, but uh, in all of those cases, except for the counter examples and the ball, maybe not so much, uh, but the, you know, the adapter one, but in all, it is a counter example, but in all of those, the most important dimension to be able to like easily identify the object of like what's going on was the longest one. And so I think that's just like super fun that like we can just see that in everyday life that, you know, have this timer here like you can't it's like what is that thing well it's a timer until you see it from that dimension uh and you can do this with so many things and like i was having fun yesterday just going around the house finding things and looking at them from the skinniest dimension it turns out that what pca does principal component analysis the first kind of ingredient of of the of the talk at nine o'clock or nine o'clock my time the, the next talk uh is is the principal component analysis it finds the widest dimension of data right and so in, we're used to thinking about things in three dimensions where you'd have like three columns of data right x y and z and pca it doesn't it works in any dimension uh so long as you can load it onto your computer and what it's going to do is it's going to highlight for you it's going to find the dimensions that are the widest. And just like it is an empirical phenomenon in our everyday life, that the widest dimension is by far the most interesting. So like, perhaps you can see that those are my glasses, but like, it's way easier to tell that they're my glasses when you get like a spread out view of them. Just like it is in real life, it happens to turn out that in data, it works really well also, right? That like you get to see the shape of things. It reveals the most important properties of the, of the data. OK, so you have homework for the talk. Find an object that has one dimension that is bigger than the other. So like my glasses, they're bigger in this dimension than either of the other two. Hide that longer dimension, take a photo and post it on Twitter. Tag me, include the text at Carl Rowe and PCA. And hopefully we get a few of these, at least a few, and we can we can put them all together. I hope you also have fun this activity. OK, so I, I have another data example that I, I didn't talk about earlier. In this example, we have 7,000 images. It's from the MNIST data set. Many of you may have heard of that. And so each image is 28 pixels by 28 pixels. Uh, and they're all handwritten twos okay so the fact that they're handwritten twos is kind of nice we're going to play with that in a second but for right now just to understand images each like column of data here would be like the how black is one pixel okay and so you have 28 by 28 pixels so it's 784 columns so each row of data is now one image this is weird because like images are, are rectangular but we're just going to like make them into rows okay so you have 784 numbers for one image you're just going to line them up all in a row and you have 7,000 rows and so now you have a 7,000 by 784 matrix or array or spreadsheet if you want and and you can compute the largest principal component to find the widest dimension in that 784 dimensional space okay so if you imagine like this has 784 dimensional space. We we can find the biggest dimension across, okay? And what I'm going to do now in this video is I'm gonna look at the twos that are on one end. I'm gonna take the average image of the twos here, and then I'm gonna slide across that dimension until we get over there, and then we're gonna slide back, okay? And so you're gonna see then in this widest dimension of twos, how the structure of the twos kind of fundamentally depends on that, that biggest dimension. So this is a video here. I hope it works. Okay, good.
don't worry, I'll play it again. Okay, so we're starting over here on the left. You can watch this this part of the screen over here on the left. Uh, or excuse me, on the right, it tells you like which part of this dimension we're looking at. I've made a histogram of like where the twos fall along this. So most twos are kind of in the middle here, but there's some twos that are way out here and there's some twos that are way out here. Okay, and then this is the average of the twos within that dimension. And so what we have over on oh, is there some feedback? What we have over on the left is kind of like a like a straight easier to to manage to. And over on the right, we have oh, there is the right right there. Uh, we have these very loopy twos, right? Uh, so I think that's super fun. So you can see that a whole bunch of changes along here as you go from like the straighter twos to the loopier twos. The, the handle of the two, it kind of becomes more relaxed. You can kind of see how the bottom of the two kind of like, it goes from being like, what is that? Uh, convex to, oh, is that concave? Concave to convex as it loops up there. And then it comes back down around. A whole bunch happens. All those kind of properties are related in the first principle component. Okay, so in the data that we were looking at before, kind of the more maybe serious examples, uh, we hope that the Y dimension will again reveal the shape of the data. So we have a question uh, from Ada, Adam Sikulski. Yeah, hi Carl, if I may, you, maybe you'll come to this, but why does it get more blurry? in the middle or maybe it's most blurry on the right i'm not sure but it just seemed like it got more more blurry in the middle maybe i'm not right sure there. right there yeah yeah that's a great question uh so if i had to guess we haven't talked about the other principal components but you get more than one right so this is the widest one but then there's a there's further dimensions, right? There's 784 dimensions. And so in the in the further principal components, we might be able to see like what's going on in this middle here. But there's a lot of twos in that middle and they're gonna have their own types of variations. You're gonna have, I can't remember what it is. I, I, I looked at, I have another video somewhere uh, that says like what these other principal components are finding, but there's a whole bunch of weird stuff going on in the middle that, you know, there are twos that don't really they don't really go from like the straight two to the loopy two. There's something, there's like other types of twos in here and they all just kind of get mushed up and blurred together. It's a great question. Thanks. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. Okay. So let's look at our data examples. Could it perhaps yeah. also not just be that you're averaging over more twos? because in the middle the histogram was uh, higher. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, so we're not only averaging over more twos, but like there's a whole bunch of variation within that middle bit there. Yeah. Other dimensions that are going off back and right that we can't see, right? They're just as like I've hidden dimensions here that make it hard to find things. It's, there's other hidden dimensions in the 784 that we cannot see there. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, if, if uh, the, the where we are calling it, uh, straight or not blurred, uh, there is only one two which is average, then uh, it's quite natural that it's not blurry. Ah, that's fair. Uh, I mean, here there, we're definitely averaging over more than one two, and it's not nearly as blurry, I don't think, as it is there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. but that's, yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, other questions about the, the twos? I've been playing with these twos on Twitter for a long time, so if anybody has come from Twitter, They've, they've seen a lot of this. Yeah, I have one last question, and maybe I, I think, um, or I hope I don't uh, overstep on any other topics in, in this talk. Yeah. So you said that you have 28 by 28 by pixels, right? So I was wondering, for example, the first or the last pixel, which would be white or empty, you have like two columns, which in most cases for all numbers are going to be zeros or empty. So how do you treat those cases? Thank you. Great. Uh, so in, in for folks that are maybe deeper into PCA or have 
studied this before, you maybe know that they're like you can do it either on the covariance matrix or the correlation matrix. And if in the so the the first and the last dimensions are going to be like up in the corner. Nobody ever, well, as long as the image is like nicely aligned, it's you're not going to have many pixels that are black up in the corners. And so many of these pixels, they never have any color in them, and they are always zero. And as a result, if you were to try and compute the correlation matrix, you're dividing by zero if there's no variation. So in this example here, uh, I've done it on the covariance matrix and not the correlation matrix. And when you do that, it just totally is fine. It just like doesn't care about those dimensions. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Other questions? I have a lot, I've, I've made plenty of time for questions, so. It's great. Maybe just maybe just one small question. Usually here, I think there is problem with correlation between the pixels in the computation. Are there any of those issues also present here? Uh, what do you mean? The so PCA in a sense is trying to understand the correlation between pixels, and if there yes. was no correlation, it would simply not work. It would find like just like white noise. So so. Um, can you say a little bit more about the concerns that you have with the correlation? I mean, usually the issue is that naturally those pixels are not uncorrelated, which also affects the computation. I was just wondering if this affects also these uh, images of Tucid anyway. Are, are you and, and are you particularly concerned here about the pixels that are that don't ha ever get any color? They're always zero. Similar, yeah, like previous question. And yeah, 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 yeah. right. So as long as you don't divide by the variance or the standard deviation of these things, all you're going to do is when you want to compute the covariance, you just have zero multiplied by anything is always zero. So all of their covariances are always zero and they just drop out of the computation. And uh, and so there's no issues. OK, thanks. Thanks. Maybe the usually was that in the previous question, is that referring to other methods than PCA? Or is it specifically for PCA? Um, no, I was maybe yeah, but maybe I was referring specifically for PC. I'm thinking of, you know, you have in this case how many numbers, seven thousands, and then probably in the first column and the last column you'll have two columns that are going to be the same, if not, yeah, they're they're perfectly correlated. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that no, or, they're not. They're yeah, all speaking from ignorance. So, so yeah. So we're not looking at correlation. We're looking at covariance. And so it's always zero. Yeah. You always have zero times zero times zero times. It's always they're all zeros. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of zeros here. It's sparse. And and as long as you don't look at the correlation, as long as you look at right. the covariance, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be OK. Yeah, it's a great more question. Of, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of more of. Again, I, I hope I'm not overextending in, in the in the talk, but in the end, we're trying to summarize information right in our data set into a smaller number of dimensions. So if you have two columns that have the same information, one of them are going to be like they're going to be redundant. That's right. So I would say that they don't have any information. If they're all zero, they don't have any information. OK. Right. It, it, the, this might feel like quibbling to folks in the audience, but it is a very important issue when you have elements that are very low so nobody brought up the case well what if there's like okay you have these that are all zero but what about this one that's like a little bit of you know uh, a little bit of variance and now you want to look at the correlation for those that uh, have a little bit of variance just a little bit so there's maybe like one image that has this pixel highlighted if you look at the correlation with these things it's going to get very messy very bad and you really even in those cases you're going to want to look at the covariance and this is a whole issue of regularization and localization that I'm super interested in that we unfortunately we don't have time to get into the details of this, yeah. but I'm happy to follow up uh, <laughs> about all of those things. Right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, so let's get to the to the to the kind of like bigger examples here. Um, so uh, the first example was is a social network uh, from the Twitter following graph. And so here I've plotted the first principal component, that is the widest dimension, against the second principal component. So I didn't tell you this, but uh, you know, so I've always been hiding the, the, the longest dimension and showing you the smallest two dimensions. Here I'm showing you the biggest two dimensions. So with PCA, you can find not only the biggest, but then the next biggest. It's orthogonal to that. And if you split it out like this, it has this really beautiful structure. 
So each dot is some random Twitter user that we sampled, and the features are which Twitter accounts do they follow. So this is the shape in the first two dimensions. This one is, uh, let's see, I'm gonna need some help here. This is a different data example. It looks very similar though, doesn't it? Each dot is a New York Times article. Uh, there's, I think, 300,000 articles. This is the popular text corpus from 20 years ago. So some folks may have played with it already. And the features are which words are included in that article. So like, is Afghanistan in that article? Is Enron, Enron was big back then. Is Enron in that article? Is the word Enron? And so in this matrix, there's 300,000 rows and 100,000 columns, 100,000 unique words, 300,000 articles. These are the first two dimensions. I've only, in all of these examples, I'm only plotting, I think, 10,000 points. So Carl, is one dimension on the horizontal and one on the vertical, or have you turned it sideways? Uh, PC1 is, I think, horizontal, and PC2 is vertical. I have not done any rotation. Great question. Yeah, you can tell that PC1 is on the horizontal because I've not centered things. Sometimes you also center things for PC. I've not done any centering. And so the first uh, PC from, oh, there's some fancy theorem that says that the first PC should always be strictly positive. And so you can see that, that it's uh, positive here. And then the second one has positive and negative values. This one, there's not as many data points but it has a similar kind of structure. Each dot is a publicly listed stock in the United States. The features are daily returns over the last 10 years. It has a similar kind of structure. And so in all those examples, we see kind of, and I should say with this one, the, there's kind of a point there that's missing. You see the point here, uh, and I'm sorry, I should have spent more time on this, but there's actually a lot of points in this point also, but I've just sampled the points such that I wanted to see the bigger points. So I've only sampled the bigger points, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of points here at the center as well, just like there are here. Uh, and here it's kind of the distribution of points is a little bit different. It's kind of not discrete data, it's more continuous data, but you still see this roughly similar shape. And, and so those are the top two dimensions. In what follows, we're not going to look at the biggest two, we're going to look at the top 10. Okay, and so in all of these, there's like thousands or hundreds of thousands of dimensions. So there's lots of dimensions. We're going to look at the biggest 10. And we're going to plot all of those 10 against one another. And when we get plots that look like this. So uh, this is, I think, the Twitter example. Um, <clears throat> and so in the each, so if you look at the panel in like the top left, it says U01, and then go one over. Here, principal component one is on the vertical axis, principal component two is on the horizontal axis. And you can go into any panel and you'll see, you know, we're just getting different two-dimensional slices of our data, um, but the 10 biggest ones. So again, each dot is a Twitter user. I think these plots are so fun. I think this one is the New York Times example. They're so similar though, it's hard to tell. This one, there's not as many points, so I can tell you that it's the financial assets. This one is the example that's in the paper. It says the each dot is an academic journal, and I've not just plotted the uh, the top five dimensions in the upper left, but I've also in this one gone all the way down to the top 100. So so I've plotted 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. So there's 22,000 dimensions. These are still like the big dimensions, and in all of these you see these like star shapes, and these star shapes continue all the way down to the hundredth dimension. So you look at 99 versus 100. If you squint, you can see that there's like a whole bunch of these things coming out. Right. In the higher dimensions, you see only maybe a couple. OK, so this is a huge introduction. Now I finally get to tell you what our paper studies. Um, so in all of those examples that we that we plotted there, I would not describe those as clusters. I would not describe those as multivariate Gaussian. You might try, but it's not going to work very well. 
Okay. In all of those examples, what we, what we see, I think, are better described as radial streaks. And so the psychometrician Thurstone, who's well known for lots of stuff, he noticed these streaks in test score data in the 1940s. And so this is from his 1947 textbook. And he invented factor rotations to handle this type of data. And for various reasons at that time, many, uh, many statisticians like really didn't like it. Uh, and we've then been confused and kind of ignored these techniques for the last like, you know, 80 years or so. So from this is an image from his from his 1947 textbook. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to start, let's see, one, two, three, four lines down over on the right where it says it seems. So it seems strange indeed. This is Thurston in 1947. And it was entirely unexpected that so simple and plausible an idea should meet with a storm of protest from the statisticians. This simple idea has turned out to be a much more powerful analytic device than was at first anticipated. OK. And so his idea is that what we should do is take those streaks that we see and align them with axes. Pick our axes, right? And so I, before we said pick the widest dimension and then the second widest dimension. And so that's the first step, yes. But then there's the second step, which is like we see these streaks, right? In all of these, we see streaks. When you have more data, it's like very easy to see these streaks. With the financial data, you don't have as much, so it's not as clear, but they're streaks nevertheless. Uh, these streaks sometimes go into the hundredth dimension, okay? So you take those streaks and you, you pick your axis. So instead of having the first axis be the widest dimension, you just pick one of those streaks and put your your axis through that streak. And then you pick an, your second axis and pick another streak. OK, that's a fancy factor rotation. Sounds like a fancy thing, but that's all it's doing. And if you do the Veramax rotation, which we'll talk about at the, at the, the full talk, and I'll define that and be more careful in that, this is what happens. But it's a visual proof of what's going on that Look at, so all, I did not like go into the data and like try and like see where the streaks are and then say define. No, I just like did this optimization thing, which is something about fourth moments. It's very simple. Gave it the PCs, did this Veramax, and these are the axes that it picks. It's the same 10 dimensional data, right? Because we're only looking at the top 10 dimensions. And it was able to then align each streak with an axis. So this is, I think, the Twitter data. This is the financial data. This is the hmm, New York Times data, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the, uh, the journal citation graph. And notice here, remember in the journal citation graph, when you looked at the 99th versus 100th PC, there were all of these streaks kind of like scattered all through it. It picks them out. And so even at the 99th versus 100th, there's still a very clear streaking pattern, and it picks up each one as an axis. And it turns out that, you know, we, you may have a lot of intuition about clusters, if you've heard of that before, and each streak can be interpreted akin to a cluster. Okay, so this is an empirical thing. So uh, in financial data, these are like industries, in Twitter data, these are like Twitter communities. So you might be in the in our when we studied the elite sphere of political discourse in the United States on Twitter, we found, you know, like there were media accounts and then there's Republicans and then there's Democrats and then there's different types of Democrats would have different types of streaks. And uh, we saw white nationalists had their own streak and we saw, uh, yeah, it was just like we called them flocks, you know, very clearly interpretable in uh, in the New York Times data. Each streak corresponds to like a topic. So if you're familiar with topic modeling, in our paper we proved that this will actually estimate topic modeling. It's consistent for topic modeling. And so like, you know, one thing is about Afghanistan, another thing is about financial stuff, and another thing is about sports. And uh, with the academic journal graph, uh, each one of these streaks corresponds to like either a discipline or a sub-discipline. Uh, so like statistics is one, probability is another. Uh, 
there's applied math and theoretical math, there's dentistry and uh, cardiovascular stuff and neurology and I mean, just like everything that you can imagine is it gets its own streak. Okay. And, and it's nice here, uh, compared to clustering, every journal is allowed to belong to multiple streaks. You not just don't need to belong to just one and also you get a weighted membership. You know, if you're way out in the streak, you're like really deeply embedded in this community. Whereas if you're kind of, you know, maybe closer to the origin, it's like, yeah, you, you do a little bit there, but you know, you uh, not as much. You maybe are not as highly cited, or maybe you're more engaged in some other community. Um, okay, so outline. We looked at high dimensional data. We have lots of columns and features for each point. We visualize the shape of these high dimensional data by looking at the widest dimensions via PCA. None of the data resembled clusters, nor did they resemble Gaussian shapes. They all had this radial streak phenomenon. I don't think it's like every data set you'll ever look at has radial streaks, but in my experience, these big data sets, it's all I've seen, unless you do some like manifold learning or non nonlinear embedding stuff, and then it gets weird with other stuff. But if you're, if you're doing kind of like raw data, you often see these radial streaks. If you see that, go look up Veramax factor rotation and read our paper. I uh, call Veramax in R, it's in base R. You can just type in Veramax and it's there. And it's going to give you new axes that align the radial streaks to the uh, with each axis. It'll be sparse, it'll be more interpretable. Okay, so your homework, go find an object, hide its, hide its longest dimension. Uh, take a picture and post it. Tag me at Carl Rowe and put in a hashtag if you like that PCA. The longest dimensions are often very informative about those objects, and that's the same with data. So the PCA finds these dimensions. When you plot them, you'll see radial streaks, and if you do Veramax factor rotation, you'll, you'll get much more interpretable principal components. And okay, so now in the, you're like, okay, if I've heard of factor rotations, like I already knew that, Carl. They already, I'm already like them. Okay, well, the reason that we're going to have this like big fancy talk next is that we now have math to show it. Okay, we now have math to show that that's a good idea, and so I think that we'll be uh, be able to convince more people that it's a good idea. Um, okay, so come find me on Twitter. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much for. Um, a great demo. I think uh, it gave a lot the ideas that will be discussed later um, in the discussion meeting. So I'll ask uh, um, the audience if uh, there is any more question that was not asked during the demo. It was quite participated already, so it makes sense. Um, any question from the audience? OK. So um, what I'm going to do is to thank again, Carl, for agreeing to give this demo. Um, since uh, most of us are going to jump to the other meeting, uh, um, including me and uh, the author, um, I may end up the um, meeting here so that we have the time to reconnect to the other um, uh, link. So it's a separate link, but you, if you are participating to the, um, to the meeting, you should have received uh, two separated links uh, um, for the demo and for the meeting. So I'll thank you again, Cara, for uh, this um, insightful um, demo. And uh, I'll thank all of you for having participating here. And uh, I'll see you at the next uh, uh, meeting in 10 minutes. I, I look forward to, to, to doing the next talk. And I hope that there's just a little bit more math. I don't mean to scare anybody off. It's just a little bit more math, but there is it is definitely a step up from this talk. But I hope that anybody that's interested and curious will come to that talk as well. Thanks so much. Okay.